Violence. Violence and more violence. That's the current situation in Ecuador. It used to be one of the most peaceful countries in the region, but over the last few years, the country has fallen victim to the ruthlessness of violent drug cartels and is turning into a narco state. All fighting over the most lucrative drug routes into Europe and the United States, most of this violence is accredited to one man in particular, and no one is safe from him, not even a presidential candidate. He is deemed to be so extremely dangerous that it took 4,000 soldiers to move him from one prison to another. But despite all those efforts, absolutely no one could have guessed what he would do next. This is the story of José Adolfo Macias Villamar and the current situation in Ecuador. José Adolfo Macias Villamar is also known as Fito. Fito was born on the 30th of September 1979 in Manta, Ecuador. Little is known about his early life and what made him the man he is today, but it is known that he grew up poor and started building an extensive criminal record at a very young age. Organized crime, robbery, possession of firearms, taking someone's life and extortion are just a few of the 30 crimes on his record. He did all that as a member of a violent cartel called Los Choneros. Los Choneros originates from the early 1990s and has been founded in the city of Chon, hence the cartel name in the western province of Manabí. The entire province of Manabí is a strategic place for drug trafficking, especially in these past few years. Its importance has grown as Ecuador is becoming the most favored South American country to smuggle from. Coke is smuggled in large quantities via maritime routes to Mexico and into the United States. Los Choneros is said to have links to the well-known Sinaloa cartel, once ran by El Chapo. After many of its members were jailed in 2011, Los Choneros became one of Ecuador's most prevalent prison gangs, controlling many aspects of life inside of the country's penitentiaries, while also directing criminal operations from behind bars. In an attempt to break up the continuously growing prison gang, Ecuadorian authorities opted for mass prison transfers. They transferred high-ranking members of Los Choneros to different jails across the country in the hopes of destructing their power. But it worked against them. It instead enabled the Choneros to extend their presence in even more prisons and create even more offshoots. They expanded rapidly. But more on that later. Back to Fito, because he was one of the many men jailed in 2011. Those 30 charges he had accrued led him to receiving a 34-year-long sentence. A long sentence. In La Roca prison, he was able to make himself quite comfortable. On the 11th of February 2013, just two years into serving his sentence, Fito decided to escape prison, together with 17 other Los Choneros members. With the help of rogue prison guards, he was able to escape the maximum security jail pretty easily. In May 2013, he was arrested once again and put back in jail. While in jail, Fito rose through the ranks and became a more important person in Los Choneros. Here's where you might ask yourself how it's possible to keep smuggling and being involved in crime while incarcerated. It's crucial to understand that prisons in Ecuador do not work the same way they do in Europe. In a lot of prisons throughout Ecuador, it's the gangs that are in charge of the prison system. Those with power make the rules and give themselves all the privileges they want. While inside, Fito was able to throw entire birthday parties with cakes, he frequently had family over, had access to weapons, liquor, drugs, and jewelry, among other items. He had so much power that he was able to have someone paint large paintings of himself and other things he liked throughout the prison. If you thought that was all, he even videotaped a music video in prison for a song of his daughter. Let's listen to a small clip. The song was an ode to him, saying he is the boss, a very good person and a man of honor. Despite all he's been accused of and charged for, Fito's mother, Marisol, always pleaded his innocence. In 2017, she said, he's being investigated for everything. They accuse him of selling drugs, stealing cars, and even stealing chickens. For everything that happens in Manta, they want to hold him responsible. Fast forward to the 28th of December, 2020 the day Los Choneros leader José Luis Zambrano lost his life after he was shot in a restaurant. José's passing is critical to what has been happening for the past few years in Ecuador and essentially changed the country forever. It sparked a violent power struggle between several different cartels that saw the opportunity to take the top spot José and his Choneros held. 
This in turn led to many brutal feuds in Ecuador's prisons, despite the gangs being all separated from each other. The violence in these prisons was so excessive that I can't even begin to explain nor show it due to the rules of this platform. That nearly 300 inmates lost their lives in 2021 probably says enough. It was decided that Jose's lieutenants, Fito, and a man named Junior Roldan would be in charge of Los Chaneros, but especially Fito's appointment divided the cartel, causing it to split into many rival factions that would all battle for the same thing, the top spot. Not long after being named in charge of Los Chaneros, Junior Roldan decided to start his own cartel, leaving Fito as the sole leader and boss of Los Chaneros. With all this tumult going on within Los Chaneros itself, their rivals smelled blood. Over the course of three years, Los Lobos, the biggest rival cartel of Los Choneros, started uniting most of the Choneros' enemies. This was all done with the aim of taking over the drug trafficking routes owned by the Choneros and essentially taking them out of the game. However, Fito wasn't taking any of it and violently retaliated against all of his enemies. This caused constant uproar in prisons throughout Ecuador as well as in the streets, where rivals would attack each other in broad daylight. 2023 was election year in Ecuador, and the politicians were well aware of the situation in their country. Combating crime became an important part of each politician's agenda, but that wasn't without the necessary risk. It was the 9th of August, 2023, two weeks before the elections, when presidential candidate Fernando Villavincencio had just left a campaign event. He was headed to his car while being guarded by multiple bodyguards and surrounded by people who were all supporters of his. But one man wasn't a supporter. He was there to do a job. The door of the car wasn't even closed yet before this man fired 12 shots through the front window. Fernando was hit three times and did not survive the attack. The shooter, an 18-year-old Colombian called Ito, attempted to flee the scene but was struck by a bodyguard of Fernando. He tried to stand up and flee again, but a mass of people had already caught up to him. He got beaten up very bad and was fatally shot. Who has ordered this hit remains unknown. However, according to several news outlets, there are very strong indications that it could have come from Fito and Los Choneros. Fernando's campaign focused heavily on fighting organized crime. He was the most outspoken politician regarding organized crime. If elected, he wants to build a new maximum security prison to house the most dangerous criminals, use military forces in the ports to combat drug trafficking, as well as build an anti-organized crime unit that would collaborate with other countries to fight crime in Ecuador. Fernando constantly referred to Los Choneros when talking about his plans to combat organized crime. Many knew this would have serious consequences. Fernando even said it himself in a TV interview weeks prior to that fatal day. He told the media that he had received serious threats from Los Choneros that they would attack him if he did not stop talking about them. Fernando replied by saying, What this does is confirm that our campaign proposal does indeed have serious implications for these criminal structures. And here I am, showing my face. I am not afraid of them. I repeat, I am not afraid of them. They said they were going to break me. Let the drug lords come. Let the hitmen come. I am not scared. In addition to the 18-year-old shooter, seven other Colombians were arrested in Ecuador as well for setting up the hit. Six of the seven men were jailed together. A month later, Ecuadorian authorities announced all six of them passed. No one's cause of passing was ever specified. Four days after the attack on Fernando, Fito was transferred to a 150-person maximum security jail in the port city of Guayaquil. President Guillermo Lasso said the transfer was meant for the safety of citizens and detainees and did not specifically refer to the incident of Fernando. It took 4,000 heavily armed soldiers to safely bring Fito to the maximum security prison. Let that sink in, 4,000 heavily armed soldiers, all to bring one man to another prison, which was not too far away. Here is where it went silent for a few months, and many hoped the problem was now solved. Well, they would be in for a big surprise. Because on the 7th of January, 2024, Police General Cesar Zapata brought some highly unexpected news. Fito disappeared from the maximum security prison where he was being held at. I say disappear because there were no signs of a violent breakout of any sort. No one ever used the word escape. He simply just wasn't there anymore. The timing was all the more interesting. It happened days before he was scheduled to be moved to another maximum security facility. Just like that, one of Ecuador's most dangerous criminals was on the loose once again. The news caused nationwide unrest and violence sparked once again. A day after the news emerged, newly appointed president Daniel Noboa decided to decree a national state of emergency. 
a measure that lets authorities suspend people's rights and mobilize the military in places like the prisons. It would be effective for 60 days. Despite the decree, chaos still ensued. During a live broadcast on national television, masked men somehow had managed to break into the set of a public television channel in Ecuador. They held all the employees hostage and proceeded to wave their firearms, some even holding explosives. To make matters worse, the presenter was held at gunpoint and threatened right in front of the camera. You could see the panic in his face. The live broadcast went on for about 15 minutes until it was finally cut off. Shots could be heard, but luckily, no one was injured. All intruders, 13 in total, had been arrested. What the intention behind this action was, as well as whom these men acted for, remains unknown. It's however very clear that this incident spread a lot of panic among the general population, as it goes to show nothing is sacred anymore, nor is anyone safe from these cartels. To make matters worse, prosecutor Cesar Suarez, who was investigating this case, was shot. He had been a prosecutor in other high-profile cases, but police suspected that his latest case, the hostile takeover, is what cost him his life. After this incident, many violent outbursts still occurred, all despite the national decree that was issued. For example, in at least seven prisons, over 158 guards and administrative workers were held hostage by inmates for several days. Videos posted on social media showed the harsh truth, leaving the families of those held hostage in fear. It once again took the help of the army to free them. Really, no one is safe. Till this day, the end of January, there is still no sign of Fito. Ecuadorian authorities have promised their citizens to find him sooner rather than later. Thus far, President Noboa hasn't been able to give a good explanation as to how it could have happened that one of the most notorious criminals managed to disappear from a maximum security jail so easily. It leaves us with a lot of questions. When will the situation in Ecuador change? And maybe even more importantly, what is needed for this change? For now, it seems to be an uphill battle. The cartels are becoming increasingly more violent and ruthless. They constantly seem to take things to unprecedented levels. This is my first video covering South American crime. If you've enjoyed it and want to see me cover more interesting stories from the South American region, please be sure to let me know in the comments. I'll make sure to only pick the most interesting stories there are and not those that have been rehashed a hundred times already. As always, please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Many more videos to come.